But now it's the top of the hour, uh, so let's get things kicked off. Welcome, everybody. Greetings. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm the forum's host, creator, and chief cat herder, Brian Alexander, and I'm very glad you made it all here today. We have a special guest who is going to give us an unusual glimpse into some bold reorganization for higher education. Now I'm just absolutely delighted to welcome this week's guest, uh, Provost and Dean Eric Boynton, faculty member, uh, is uh, the Provost and Dean of Beloit College. Uh, and at Beloit, among other things, uh, Eric has led a massive reinvention of that campus's entire academic year coming up in terms of its calendar and the ways that students interact uh, with faculty and with their entire campus. So I'd, I'd really like to hear from him how that works, what he's learned from doing it, and uh, what he hopes to do next. So welcome, Dean Boynton. Thank you, Brian. I uh, appreciate uh, being here, and then I look forward to the conversation. Uh, me too. Me too. I'm really glad you could make time. I know that this is a, a crazy time for the scheduling for the chief academic <laughs> officer of a, of a college. Um, so uh, first of all, I. I introduce people in all kinds of ways, and, and by email and social media, I've, I've linked to bios of you and everything else. But I find a great way to get people to know a Future Transform guest is to ask them what you're going to be spending most of your time on for the next year. What are the big projects or the big topics that are going to be devoting, you know, taking up most of your mind as, as you look ahead? Right. So that's a great question because it's difficult for me to pay attention to that kind of question when what's right in front of me is the demand, right, to attend to uh, what's gonna happen next week and, and the ways in which uh, the fall is gonna unfold. But at the same time, we have to be attentive to the ways in which we're working presently to, um, to attend to the challenges that are right on our face as a preparation for what's coming. And uh, the one way to, to to state it is that there's no silver lining to COVID. There's no happy occasion here for us to think differently. Mm. But there is a way in which um, the liberal arts experience, the the kind of education that uh, that I was uh, trained in as undergraduate, and the the kind of education I went back to as soon as I got my PhD, um, the kind of institutions I've been in, I do think that there is a relevance for the small liberal arts education. Um, for the world that we currently are inheriting. And so there's a way in which this COVID moment brings to clarity the kind of work we're doing that positions us for the future. And, and that's mm. broadly, that's how I answer that question, is that the work I'm engaged in now is not simply pouring water on parched earth. Mm. It's thinking about how to structure this place now and preparing it for a really interesting entry into the world that's post-COVID. I mean, let's say after vaccination, which is, of course, not a world that's without challenge or topsy-turvy. It'll go upside down again. But the ways in which small liberal arts um, is meeting this challenge in creative ways. And I'm, as, that's not to say that that uh, taking this, this, uh, this crisis as an opportunity, I think it's slightly different than that. It's the recognition that we have to meet the challenge, and in meeting the challenge, we prepare for the future. Does that begin to answer your question? It begins to answer the question. Um, and, uh, you know, a few months ago, if I would have asked um, the typical provost or dean, they would have said something like grappling with accreditation, um, you know, uh, uh, dealing <laughs> rolling out a new core curriculum or, uh, you know, uh, launching a new uh, writing center or something, but instead now you're at this kind of existential and forward-looking moment at the same time. Um, well, right. I, I have so many questions to ask, and, and friends, please, I'm going to ask a few questions to get the ball rolling, but the forum is really, really here for you. Uh, I'd love to hear what you would like to ask, uh, and uh, I can promise you Dean Boynton is uh, uh, very friendly. He doesn't have a beard, but you can trust him nonetheless. Um, the, uh, one question I want to ask you is, one of the things that you've done um, over this summer, while all of higher education has been topsy-turvy, uh, you managed to reformat the hard drive of the campus. That is, you, you rebuilt the academic calendar. So instead of having semesters, 
you now have mods. Can you can you tell us what that means and then tell us how on earth you were able to do that in the middle of all this chaos? Right. So this is a situation where mods came to the fore. Uh, COVID was a catalyst for this idea, right? Hmm. So I, I can tell you that um, I came into this job with this idea of, of demonstrating the relevance of small of arts to a broader um, uh, part of the population. Right? Demonstrated this is the kind of education that people should invest in. And that activity was constantly forward looking, constantly on the offense. And in the moment of COVID, this is middle of March, I found myself in a complete de defensive crouch. Uh, and, a, and a stance that was traveling forward with such velocity. And at that moment, of course, COVID put the brakes on on everything that we were thinking we were doing. Yeah. And it was a moment in which uh, a meeting with the president and I, Scott Bierman, and uh, I told him that I felt as if I was in the fog of war and I, I could not see to see the next possibility. And at that point, we decided we'd table the situation in the middle of March that was taking place and we decided to think about the fall. And I wanted to find ways to maximize flexibility and minimize disruption. And that's where the mods plan really came in the floor. How is it that we can deliver our curriculum in really interesting ways in the face of this COVID moment that demonstrates that we're an institution that's innovative and forward looking. And here, here's where I, I got this offensive posture back is, is there a way that the institution is doing its work that will mirror or reflect the kind of education as a parent and a student you would expect to get at Beloit? So, so the, the task was not simply to keep the doors open or find right ways to, uh, to teach um, our students from an institutional level, but can we express or embody the way our educational mission in the way we're treating this challenge, which is MODS. And so MODS was a way to invigorate um, uh, how it is we're gonna attempt to teach students in the fall next year. And so it provides this maximal kind of flexibility. So there's a hinge point in the semester. I mean, all these kinds of reasons why we went about it. We could pivot away from campus or back to campus. It also, there's essentially two courses in each MOD which means it simplifies the schedule. And one of the aspects of that is that there's a lot of less passing time. And so it's a much safer campus as well. It also, and here's where mods is both related to the COVID moment, but thinking about the future, simplifies the schedule, opens up the possibility of recognizing other kinds of activity that students could engage in during the day that could be included uh, in their learning um, uh, environment. So I, I lost the question a little bit, but but how is it we came about it? It was this idea of um, a small liberal rights institution finding a way to express its values in, interesting enough, in the way we deliver our curriculum. And, and I, I guess this is where it's not like this bright, shiny new thing. It's like brass tacks on the ground. How is it we're going to conduct ourselves as an expression? Of our mission. Well, let, let me let me let me press on that to ask a, a couple of explanatory things. And by the way, if if um, if you haven't seen it on the bottom left of your screen, just above the little white strip, you should see a kind of orange colored boy action plan link. So if you click on that, uh, you will get uh, a lot of different. Uh, uh, you get a link to their uh, explanatory site. And before I can say anything more, before I can even budge, the awesome, awesome demographer uh, and previous guest in the program, Nathan Graw, has a question. Let me just flash this up on the screen. Uh, because whenever Nathan says something, I want to make sure that I hear it and that I make sure everybody else hears it. Um, Nathan asks, for two years in a row, Beloit adopted a substantial change in short order. What was key to your developing campus buy-in for rapid change? Oh, great question. Thanks, Nathan. And uh, I know that, that Nathan is close to Beloit because uh, I do believe, is it is it true? I've heard this rumor, Nathan, that uh, Scott Bierman actually hired you at Carleton. I think that might be the case. <laughs> anyway, it just might be something I dreamt about. Um, but yeah, the, the speed by which we, we went about this. So 
here's here's I think the interesting um, interesting story is that I was I've only been employed now a little more than a year. Um, I was brought in in order to think about the learning environment uh, at a small liberal arts that would engage both what happens in inside outside the classroom. Um, to, if you want to put it this way, weaponize the idea that students learn in every nook and cranny of the place as a way of expressing the value proposition of employed education. So a year ago, last summer, I, I came in and within two weeks, I was sitting in a three week period with 12 other colleagues to think about innovations we we're going to engage at Beloit. So two aspects of the Beloit action plan, the new advising structure, which we're calling the advanced mentoring program, and career channels. Those two were built out a year ago last summer, and we started to implement those over the past year. So that implementation process, Nathan, involved eventually nearly half the faculty. So we had not just a team that developed it over the summer, but then we um, um, uh, launched uh, implementation teams. And imp implementation teams made up of both faculty and staff in order to bring the ideas we developed last summer to fruition over this year. So already there was kind of a, a, a massive uh, um, effort across campus to get these things done. Goodwill was built in. Um, the ways in which I came in wanting to see something like this happen, but all the ideas were generated from the place and already percolating. And I, I'll have to say that the mods idea, this is a slight tangent, but the mods idea was not my idea. It was an idea developed at Beloit five years prior, hmm. not implemented because the conditions were different at Beloit at the time. But in a meeting in which we're talking about maximizing flexibility for the fall, I saw someone in the meeting with the, and this comes from being in the classroom, right? When, you, when you're teaching something and you see a light bulb go off in someone's head and right. immediately you go to that student, you ask, what is it, what is it that you just resonated with? I want to know. Yeah. And uh, the, the faculty member slash student in the audience said, you know what? I think that there, we developed something that called that was called the mod, the mod plan. And he, he went back and found the document in the space of this meeting. Mm. And all of a sudden mods was born, reborn in this meeting. So I think part of the speed is that um, people were ready. There's an urgency. Yeah. There's a recognition that the bones are extremely good at Beloit, but mm. that we need to find a way to express it. And so people were in, ener energized, engaged in the fall semester. COVID hit, and I can tell you COVID catalyzed those two ideas. So we had the AMP idea and the career channels idea. If you look at the Beloit action plan, it's foregrounded by the mods idea. Mm -hmm. And then on the other end is a pricing structure. And so the, there's a COVID moment that allows these two things to fold into a five kind of pointed star that made sense together. Uh, at the same time, we were already engaging with a marketing firm. And so they had already come on board. Wow. And so it was just kind of this pulling together of all these efforts um, at this time and a bit of a, of a risk and a willingness to be out there. I think we were already on our toes and COVID hit. We just kept leaning into it. Mm. And in the urgency, we're going to go with the mods plan. We needed to make sure that students signed up for it and not students signing up for a semester long course, blowing it up and then reestablishing a semester. And so then we had 10 days by which to establish the mod structure before students looked at courses, before they engaged in the mod registration. Wow, 10 days. And so all those things, this kind of heavy mix of, of coming together. So it's, it's both really large kind of uh, um, issues around the future of liberal arts, but at the same time, certain things that are specific to Beloit, but at the same time, I think really narrowly defined calendar issues <laughs> that allowed us to operate very quickly. I, I hope that begins to, I mean, I'm already talking too long on that question. But that, that question is right in the sweet spot of what we're up to. Up to. It, it really is. It's, uh, it's, thank you, Nathan, for that uh, really, really good question. And, uh, and, and thank you, Eric, for a very detailed answer. I, um, friends, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a text question. You can see how easy that is. So just hit that uh, question mark button if you want to type in your own question. Um, and uh, I did have one uh, one follow-up question there for myself, which is, 
Um, tell us more about the uh, advising plan. What did you What did you change? Liberal arts colleges usually have a very close advising relationship. Uh, what did you do differently? Mm -hmm. So what we did is that we pulled the advising mentoring program out of a traditional classroom space. And so we have a model now, and this is the advanced mentoring program where it's, it's actually, you know, so at Beloit, a normal course would be one unit. So four units is a normal load. This advising course is a quarter unit. And so it's not a full blown content driven course. And so yeah. Beloit, like the other institution I was at prior to coming to Beloit Allegheny, mm -hmm. um, you know, we had first year seminars and first year seminars were content light, process rich, mm -hmm. and you, it's like a homeroom, you have, you have something to talk about in terms of content, but it, it's, it's not quite uh, a, a normal kind of course. Um, and what we found in order to preserve the value of the curriculum in order to offer a full accompaniment of majors and minors, and at the same time, allow a student to see their path through the institution. So advanced mentoring program and also career channels is a way of trying to make the institution less opaque. Hmm. I mean, the kinds of students that we're, that we're uh, bringing in, we need to be a student ready campus, not ask admissions to find college ready students. We needed techniques in order to bring students into the institution to show how the institution is going to fill their sails filled with wind as they push towards their future and so instead of putting them in a traditional class we engage them in this advanced mentoring program so a professor has two sections of these advanced mentoring groups each one has about 10 students so small right and these uh, advanced mentoring program sessions. They run every other week. It involves um, peer mentoring. So peers come in, but it's also a student to student talk to each other in these kind of low risk uh, conversations about what it is they're doing at Beloit, how they see their career at Beloit unfolding and where it is they're heading into the future. And so we've evacuated in some sense the content and that in the place we've talked about, how is it that you're going to find your way through this institution and how is this institution going to help you, you know, meet your goals and aspirations? And so it's a different kind of uh, advising relationship. I can tell you right now that it pulls the advising relationship out of the office and puts it in the groups. And this is one of the experiments I conducted at Allegheny before I left, hmm. the kind of conversations you can have in a group setting around advising is really different than the ones in which the student feels as if they have to come into your office as a professor and feels as if they have to have their act together before they utter a word to their mm -hmm. advisor. This is a much more fluid. So it's a way of bringing the student into the, into the learning environment. And then we build out certain uh, activities that all the AMP advisors are gonna engage in. And these are cross campus. And a lot of these activities are gonna be about career readiness, about um, uh, um, doing well in courses, but also around our values. So in the fall, a number of anti-racist um, kind of uh, groups are being formed in which AMP will flow through these kinds of activities. Mm. Uh, and um, so, so it, in that last two years, and so it's, it's, a, it's an arc that persists for two years. The professor remains with these groups for two years. So the professor has a two year commitment and then uh, we, we um, these students become, you know, uh, have a major advisor within their, their majors. And at that point, we can talk about this, but this is where a career channel kind of takes over. So AMP provides them the space to get to a major, but then the major is not the point of your education all the way. <laughs> the major has to lead somewhere and career channels allows you to envision your future from there. Does that does that start getting at the question, Brian? It does, and it sounds like a that's a much deeper and uh, and richer innovation than, than I thought. And but we have a whole bunch of questions that actually go back to the uh, to the mods um, sequence. So I want to give folks sure. to uh, ask those. So um, uh, here's one from uh, John Henry Stites, also at Georgetown. Does an institution offering intensive short duration mods need to have a large cadre of tenure track full time faculty? Or could it be done in a program where 95% of the faculty are adjunct? Interesting question. 
Jeez. Uh, <laughs> well, so here, I, I don't have, I have, I haven't asked myself that question because Beloit, of course, is largely populated by tenure track faculty. So, small liberal arts away from major metropolitan area, mm -hmm. you just, uh, you're just going to have most of your faculty are going to be full time tenure track, or if they're not full-time tenure track, they've been with you for a long time and demonstrated really good work, right? Um, so I wonder, um, so what the mods does do is it provides interesting flexibility for dropping courses in and out. And so one of the things that we see in the future, if we continue with mods uh, past this year, is that there's interesting ways to link courses in each mod that if you have four crosses, courses across the semester, it becomes more difficult. So I can imagine that if you had the flexibility of uh, hiring uh, adjuncts, you could insert into the curriculum at different mod points uh, courses that would resonate with maybe what's going on in the standard form. And then, then you could begin, like over years, over a bit of time, you could emphasize the direction of the campus Right. right, and pull back and, and maybe put in other directions through the use of, of adjunct faculty. I, that's my first, I, I love that. I love that, that kind of thinking. I, I like to do that kind of thinking. Um, Beloit probably is not going to have that luxury. We're, we're going to be thinking about doing this with standard tenure track faculty members. But Brian, do you have, do you, does that, do you have any ideas there? Uh, I've got a couple. Um, I, I mean, I say first, John Henry, thank you. Uh, that, that's a great question. And I would say that what you're describing in, in many ways may be almost unique to the elite liberal arts small college, private college world, which has majority tenure track faculty, um, whereas the rest of the country does not mostly. But, um, but this is this interesting question of flexibility for the fall. Uh, and you know, do you respond by really maximizing your full-time faculty, um, and maybe you know repurposing them in different parts of the curriculum, or do you uh, instead shift towards a, a fully adjunct um, complement, which is much more much more flexible? But th there are there are a whole bunch of questions that just followed up, and I want to <laughs> I want to get these all on the table because these folks are are, are wonderful. Uh, we have interim dean uh, Ronald Samuel Friedman at Purdue Fort Wayne. Uh, oh, he, he asked a great question, but you already answered, so that's fine. Uh, and then uh, Mark Berman at Santa College uh, has a question about um, the mods. That I'm wondering, are they based on or similar to the Colorado College block system? Okay, so here's the inside story. So in that meeting I told you about with Scott Beerman and I, when we were talking about, okay, what's going to maximize flexibility and minimize disruption? Yeah. Our, our first, in that, in that hour and a half meeting that stretched three hours, our first idea was a block schedule. I mean, that would then you'd have four hinge or three hinges within the space of a semester, right? Uh, and that's the idea I took initially to um, a faculty group. So the ASP, the um, Academic Strategic Planning Committee, which is the major committee on campus. I took this idea within a few days to that group, and uh, frankly, the block plan was shut was shot down by people in the room. Uh, uh, it, I, I think it's, and I think it's true that there's a certain kind of student that gravitates towards those kinds of intense classroom um, hmm. experiences, hmm. and and uh, the faculty didn't think that Boyd students wanted to experience the curriculum as single courses like that, and so we landed on mods, which was this compromise, this this recognition that uh, it spaces those courses out to seven and a half weeks, right? So you have a little bit more time. You have two per um, versus one in the, in the block plan. But uh, I think there's their cousins, they're related. Um, but I, what's interesting is that, and I'm just gonna toot my own horn here for a second, is that there are 12 or 15 campuses that I know of, mainly small liberal arts, that have gone with the mods plan. They have not gone with the block plan. Huh. And I think that's really interesting. I, I, I do think that Colorado, you know, and um, and um, Cornell uh, College, mm -hmm. that there's a certain kind of student that they're pulling from that want to come to a college like that. Mm -hmm. And the rest of us realize, you know what? That's not really what our current students have come to our space to experience. So we need to be careful, 
right, that we're curating a, a kind of experience that is going to resonate with the students we do have. Um, so that's a that's a, a great question. Uh, it is a good question, um, and this is uh, uh, thank you for the really clear answer. Um, now you said you would give us the inside story. We have another question which oh. uh, asks for more. <laughs> Well, you, you'll, you'll see where this is going. Um, and, and this is from okay. Western University, Rachel Barlow, who directs assessment there. And she says, when faculty were resistant to the MODS ideas you were developing it, what were their biggest concerns and how did you talk about them? And you just mentioned one, that idea of the different student and MODS versus uh, blocks. But let's say more about that. What was, uh, mm -hmm. what was the pushback and how that worked? So it, it's interesting because certain faculty I talked to, I would... I would utter this idea of mods seven and a half week splitting up the semester, and then I would didn't, wouldn't offer an argument. I would just describe what it looks like, and I just let it sit. And for certain faculty, it would be about ten seconds, and there'd be silence, <laughs> and they would go, "Oh, right, right, <laughs> yes, I see where that." And other faculty, we had hour and a half long conversations before at the end, and and this is true. I'm not blowing smoke here. I mean, everybody is ready for this. Everybody is, has bought into this. And and we had to have that readiness because we were going to ask students to be advised by faculty to right. register for mods. And so we couldn't have faculty who are advising students saying, you know what, we got this cockamamie idea, this idiot provost guy, he's been here a number of months and he has this crazy idea and I hate it. So we couldn't have that and have a successful kind of advising period. Um, so by and large, I mean, there's 100% of faculty on board. Some of the wrinkles were language faculty going, wait a minute, if I truncate that, mm. right, yeah. how is that going to work in my language? And then, so what happened is that the chair of languages says, you know, here's an interesting model is that within the mods plan, because you have real flexibility, you have large chunks of time to teach your courses over a week, but you have real flexibility of how you're going to do that. So an, uh, a, um, a language course can meet every single day of the week. Yeah. And then they realize, oh, that's exactly what I've always wanted. I wanted to be this kind of process oriented classes like uh, languages or logic, for instance, you need to be at this thing every single day in order to really capture what's going on. And then a history professor says, you know what? No, 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 no. You, you've got to go read a book. Right. And then we're going to talk about it for three hours yeah. and we're going to meet twice a week. Yeah. And so it's interesting that once you started working through, it's like, wait, well, there's a flexibility built into the mods that actually pays attention to the different ways that faculty are going to teach rather than hemming in, them in to certain kind of standard ways of thinking. And so that was um, a series of conversations we had with the faculty as a whole, but also we have disciplinary groups. So they broke off in their disciplines mm -hmm. and they talked about the ways in which uh, mods could be mapped on other courses. And it required, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, it required intense creativity and flexibility <laughs> to rethink the fall. Uh, and this summer they're doing that work on top of thinking about how you're going to develop hybrid courses. Uh, one of the serendipities, one of the things that allows, to go back to Nathan's questions for the speed, is that we received a, a quarter million melon, uh, quarter million dollar melon grant uh, right at the end of my summer. So I took this idea and I, we went and pitched it to Mellon. They said, it sounds like a good idea. Here's $200,000 for the next 18 months. Roll with it. Yeah, it was a planning and so we then use that, money. Yeah, we use that money to develop faculty. And so faculty then um, get stipends this summer to develop these courses. And the serendipity is that um, they were developing these courses around the career channels innovation. So how is it that I can link my courses to careers and think interestingly about that? And what happens is that they're linking their courses around what it means to to be in line with the strategic direction the campus is taking and mods and now hybrid. And then the the, the building out of workshops of the summer has been rather intense and, and rich as well. And so that was the coming together of, of events in, in really serendipitous ways. Oh, that's, that's fascinating. Uh, uh, first of all, that's... Um, Rachel, thank you very much for that uh, for that really really good question, um, and uh, and second, uh, Eric, thank you for taking. I, 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 I real quick, Brian, Brian, real quick. 
Please. is that in consultation with these other, the other schools, the other schools, of course, after I we did this, you know, I was uh, talking to everybody on interviews. Everybody wanted to hear about this. But then I'm getting calls three a day of provosts across the nation <laughs> asking me that question, like, oh, how'd you do that? Uh, okay. And through those conversations, we actually sent out, I won't name names, but we sent out emissaries from our faculty to help other faculty at other small liberal arts institutions to deal with those kind of questions in their faculty. Hmm. Uh, and it was labs, it was languages, it was history, it was those kinds of things, yeah. So maybe- Sorry, we, I just- that no, more right. that's, that's very, very important. And uh, and that, that further answers the question that your faculty actually became paladins, uh, evangelists of, of this. Um, and I, I'm I'm surprised that people don't call it the uh, Bullet program, or the uh, you know the Bullet mod system. Oh, that rubs you the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> but not calling it or, or calling it. Um, not, not not calling it. Yeah, not giving the uh, public approbation. <laughs> well, well, you you got it. It's fine. You've got it here. You've got it here. Um, <laughs> And that's that's the first round of questions that, that folks have had. Um, uh, friends, I, I've got a couple of just small questions I want to ask just to uh, clarify a couple of points. But again, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so we've been talking about the mods. We've been talking about the politics of, and institutional shift of, of having this happen. We've been talking about Eric's vision uh, for, for Beloit in this crisis. Um, what else would you like to ask? Would you like to ask more, for example, about the uh, the uh, AMPs and the advising and mentoring? Uh, would you like to ask more questions about the um, uh, how mods are going to play out in terms of registration or in terms of advising or more curricular change? Again, just at the bottom of the screen, make sure you just either hit the raised hand if you want to join us on stage or click the question mark to type in a question. It, my really quick question is, You've described very, very beautifully the, the role of faculty uh, in this in, entire change process. But this is a small liberal arts college. What, what was the role of students in all of this? Right. So to be sure, the work had to happen very quickly. And so um, students were consulted after the plan had really developed in a the, in the robust way. Uh, and we went to students early on and talked to them about the mods, uh, the look of the mods. Um, and what actually catalyzed the students was, and this is actually the beginning of our relationship, right? Is that the campus, the, the campus newspaper, you know, um, small publication, <laughs> a, a small institution, um, they interviewed me. And it, they interviewed me before uh really we had talked publicly about the institution of mods and so i took the opportunity to talk about mods in the fall in that interview and that interview with the student who uh, was a senior and uh, really knew her way around the place and we talked about how mods was baked into the dna of beloit and how it was an expression uh, of the way in which uh, students could engage in their coursework in really interesting ways with their faculty. That um, interview that was then aired a few days later in the um, campus newspaper is, is essentially what introduced uh, this idea to students. And then through Beloit Student Government, uh, there's co-presidents. Uh, we had uh, a, a webinar or an on-stage kind of event in which we rolled the thing out to students. And um, there was some initial uh, hesitation among students, but then people basically the same way the faculty said, oh, that's, that's an interesting way to go about business in the fall. Um, and then what happened is that we started getting really interesting press nationwide. And this is where... Um, my encounter with Brian is that Brian, for some, I don't know how, but you saw the campus article, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the campus article went viral in really interesting ways and it hit Twitter somehow. And I'm not a big Twitter user, but, uh, but then when I saw you tweet something about what you saw in the campus about mm -hmm. the mods plan, mm -hmm. then I reached out to you. Yeah, Cause I knew you from other spaces and I said, thanks, you know, Brian for, for the shout out. And so that was the, actually the origins of our relationship too. <laughs> so, so students were open to it and friendly to it, uh, but it did, I have to say there wasn't a lot of student input in the idea, but 
again, in the DNA of the place, it was not shocking when we came up with it. Um, and in that regard, it did not hit flat footed or, or in, uh, in a, in a surprising kind of way. Well, I'm really glad. Um, and, uh, I, I, I love the use of a student newspaper to introduce uh, institutional change. I think that's that's fantastic. Um, and uh, I appreciate the question of time uh, and speed. Um, we have, uh, so thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a couple more questions have just popped in. Um, we have, uh, Diane, uh, people must mangle your name all the time, so I'm gonna try my best. Um, this is uh, Diane Deutersloft. Um, a librarian at St. Mary's who asks about the career channels and, the, and how they intersect with the mods. Could, could you provide some examples of that? Mm -hmm. So we have, yeah, we're still thinking about how career channels links with mods because right, mods are relatively soon on the scene and we are developing career channels. But uh, think of career channels as, as broad interdisciplinary streams. So um, we health and healing is one of the channels. Um, entrepreneurship is another channel. Um, sustainability is another channel. So the ways in which majors and courses and faculty and staff fit within this broad trajectory where a student can see that the kind of work they're engaged in both in and outside the classroom. This is a crucial idea. This is not just linking class ideas. This is a way in which a demonstration that a Boyd education, and this is a small liberal arts education I would maintain, is that you integrate what happens to you in the classroom with what happens outside the classroom. So sustainability, the kind of internship you get or your travel abroad experience or the work study you do on campus. And this is one of the really exciting things. Instead of thinking about work study as just a job I have in order to bring home some take home pay, is the work study job I have is actually involved in these channels. And we built out those channels to include work study. This stream that then takes what it is you're engaged in academically and demonstrates the relevance of it as you begin to reach towards uh, commencement. And I don't want to say graduation, I want to say commencement, the commencing of your life and the way in which Beloit College can be a launching pad to your future. Uh, and so we have these five channels that are built out. Um, the ways in which mods would link in, and here's here's, Okay, I, I need to say this because I need to say this publicly, is that the decision to move to mods beyond next year is a faculty decision, right? Mm -hmm. There's no way mods is gonna work unless faculty say, yes, we wanna teach in this way. And right. so this is a year of an experiment. We're gonna assess the heck out of it. We're gonna figure out if something you wanna do, but let's say it persists in the future. It's not my call, but let's say it persists in the future. Then I do think it provides some interesting flexibility uh, in students' lives to add in these extra kind of what we called in the past extracurricular, and I would call meat and potato experiences, right? Right at the beating heart of what your education is about, that the experiences you have on and off campus relate to what happens in the classroom. That's the way in which I think MODS provides flexibility for our channels idea, our career channels idea. Uh, does that begin to answer the question? Well, uh, Diane, I think uh, uh, that's up to you. Please, uh, you know, give me a, give us a ping on uh, uh, and respond. And we're, of course, happy to bring you back up on stage to uh, uh, to uh, talk further about that. What, one wrinkle I want to add, just to make sure that I pay attention to our question, is at the end of career channels and built into the career channels are these professional networks, staff, faculty, crucially, alumni, and friends of the college coming back in and populating networks of advising that then, and within these channels, right, people who are out in the workforce working in sustainability like uh, careers, coming back in to advise our students before they graduate, after they graduate too, but before they graduate as a way of integrating career readiness into the curriculum and not simply professors saying to the student, okay, now it's time for you to go encounter the people in career center. Yeah. But yeah. weaving that into the very heart of what, are you, what you're doing here at Beloit. Well, that's wonderful. And that's uh, not easy to do necessarily in a liberal arts world. But before I go down that road, um, um, we have uh, 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 interim Dean uh, Friedman uh, has a different question. 
uh, that's related to this, which is, do you have uh, professional advisors, staff? Uh, and mm -hmm. if so, what is their mm -hmm. role in AMP? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, we don't. I, I know the schools do have that. And it's a really interesting model. Small of our arts, uh, we just wouldn't have the capacity to build that out. Mm -hmm. um, right now, every AMP advisor for the, for the fall is a faculty member. And, and here's a situation in which um, we do have to ease into this somewhat. Uh, you know, I, I took the role of provost at Bloyd. The role, everybody from academic side reports to me and everybody from student life reports to me. And the attempt was to think about the integration of those two things. And I, I hope you hear that in the way of talking about career channels, right? That kind of integration. Uh, the problem is, is there's still two sides. And the provost can't do the work of integration integration you you have to go way back into the ecosystem and begin to draw the the linkages right and career channels is the way to draw those linkages amp is a way to draw those linkages um and so what i anticipate the next cohort of amp instructors will be staff oh. because of course there's no there's no content in these courses you, you, you don't have to have a phd in fact there are certain staff who would rock the mic on these AMP courses. Right? It's exactly the kinds of people you want your students in front of and to be engaged in. Uh, and so there's a way in which AMP uh, 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 expands how I can think about advising and mentoring across campus um, that before they get to their major advisor, which will be a faculty member, I can expand the ways in which staff step into those roles and play a crucial role uh, across campus and not, not an extracurricular kind of role, but right at the beating heart of our educational mission, staff are involved in making sure students understand what's important about this education. Oh, interesting. Um, that's a really, really good question. And by the way, in the in the chat, uh, um, it, it turns out that I accidentally um, connected uh, Ronald Samuel Friedman to a 1970s semi-famous singer-songwriter named Dean Friedman. Thank you, Joel Bloom, for uh, making that connection i I'm, I'm sure ron's gonna get a lot of this from now on I'm, my my apologies that's great uh, we have a, an, another question from uh, annie epperson um at university of northern colorado she's a librarian which means she's awesome uh and she wants to know about assessment uh, how are you going to assess the fall experiment right so uh we do okay so here's here's where there are certain parts of my brain that are shoving out other things in order to make room for uh, COVID uh, related issues. I have had numerous conversations uh, with the institutional research office about how they're gonna do that. And HEADS is involved and Nessie is involved and there's they're built out processes by which to assess it. I'm afraid I, I, I need to phone a friend in order to answer that question in any kind of detailed way. Uh, there is a plan, I can't tell you what that plan is Huh. Um, I just don't, this is a, a capacity problem. My head, I'm not, not smart enough. Or I don't have enough RAM, right? Isn't that RAM? There's the counter space, right? Uh, uh, there's a, there's a bit <laughs> in the processing Sherlock. power. Uh, there's a bit in a Sherlock Holmes story <laughs> where he talked about trying to forget something that he doesn't need anymore in order to make room for uh, uh, everything else. And always struck, struck. Right. Um, we're, we're coming close to the end of the hour and I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to uh, ask their questions. Um, and uh, Annie, thank you. I'm glad you asked the question. Um, uh, this is from uh, Bob London, who's the Alpha Phi Mega Executive Director, and he wants to know about applying this elsewhere. Do you think mods could work at other types of institutions, such as large research-based ones or community colleges? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's, again, this is like that other question uh, about non-tenure track faculty teaching. I, I mean. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is what I love. I love to think about that. Um, I have not had the time or the space to muse about the possibilities, except for right now. So, um, yeah, I, I imagine that the, the possibilities are endless. And let's let's say, here's one interesting, here's one way to get at that. When we developed mods at Beloit, we actually didn't need to invent any kind of new curriculum device. They already existed within the curriculum. We actually had a way of, and I, Allegheny had it too, a way of carving up the semester into two blocks. 
Right. right. And so I imagine the whole bunch of institutions already have the capacity to run mods. So what if you ran mods, not every course, but what if you began to multiply the occasions that students could take a course in a mod form? Hmm. And, and instead of like in other campuses like McAllister and Grinnell and other places like that uh, um, who have gone to the full mods plan for every course, what if what if you did like 10 percent of your courses like that? And then maybe it's 20 percent and then you start ramping it up and you go at this in a gradual kind of way and you see how students are experiencing it. And, you know, what we found at, at, at Beloit is that there are certain courses, certain experiences that need to be the full semester. If you have a major project, you can't squeeze it in the seven and a half. So we, we do have some educational occasions that cut across the whole semester, even next year. But what, what if you did it differently and you kind of began gradually to build out mods? That might be an interesting kind of model at other kinds of places. I know, Brian, is that, does that resonate? Is that? It does. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking about the different ways this could play out. And, uh, uh, you know, also, Bob, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about how some of these institutions that you're talking about are less unified uh, than a small liberal arts college. And you think about mm -hmm. what multiple mm -hmm. schools within them and multiple branches. Um, I, I went to the University of Michigan as an undergrad, and there was a, a small residential liberal arts college inside of it, basically. Um, uh, or uh, Columbia University actually has Barnard College as a, as a legally separate liberal arts college. You know, I wonder about like you know having those experiment or having a uh, particular department or program say uh, the sciences do that. Um, I mean, I, I, it's it's a fascinating question, Bob. Uh, it may be that right now we are fortunate to have caught um, uh, Eric as he is launching the mod revolution nationwide. Um, <laughs> We have a, a we have a question uh, a follow up question from Mark Berman, um, who has a uh, who says that as an ex administrator, I'm very happy to hear about involving staff in the AMP program with more direct contact with students. What training are you providing for them? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, right now, Mark, I mean, it's more like oh, geez, that person is already well suited. That person has already been working with students. That so there's already an array of staff members at Beloit. And I guess this is the nature of small liberal arts. Is that um, as I told Brian one time at Beloit, we eat every part of the animal. Right. Um, there's a way in which staff have already kind of been doing this work. I mean, for decades. At a place like Beloit, they're already kind of engaged in this work with with students, um, and so it's not a it's not a leap to begin to in, include staff. So there are there's a like a ten staff right now that I know could do the work with no training at all, and and these are staff that would understand the curriculum. I think the training would come in. We need to get a little bit more familiar with the way the curriculum rolls. Um, we need to get more familiar with the way in which faculty see the institution so that mm -hmm. students don't get one sided versus the other like i was advised by a staff member so i had this pers perspective on the institution versus the faculty perspective um but i think that's a, a great question um I, one of the ideas we have is that in future amp iterations we would bring people who want to be amp advisors as an, an apprentice model, have them come into an AMP group and see someone who's been seasoned at this, how they do their work. Oh, I see. And that might be an, an initial way of beginning to bone people up into AMP advisors. And then in addition, maybe getting them to not memorize, but be more familiar with yeah. curriculum or certain aspects, student experience that they just need to know. Well, I'm thinking different different staff, depending on their position, will have more or less access to the curricular experience. Um, I'm thinking about, I mean, for example, that will be the registrar's uh, office, which you know, that's where they live, um, as well as <laughs> IT staff, people who are instructional technologists, or in the library, the ones who are really student facing. Uh, Mark, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, thank you very much for, for asking this. Um, we are at the last couple of minutes of, of, of our hour, and uh, so I, I guess I, I'd, I'd like to ask you to imagine, uh, say, uh, four years from now, um, where you've had uh, your first undergraduate population has gone through a complete all mod experience. Not, you know, it's, that's that's they've been modded the entire time. Um, 
how do you, you know, mm-hmm. what are they going to be like in 2024, 2025? Yeah. So I, I do know, I think it was last week that um, an article came out of disparaging the idea of agility. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that one. <laughs> and that's an overused word. And like, okay, okay, fine. But there is a way in which Small of Our Arts is preparing people to dodge and weave and move and, you know, just be nimble about the situations that they find themselves in order to meet challenges in interesting ways. I think mods is a way of pouring accelerant on that attitude of Small of Our Arts that we're preparing people for meeting the challenges of what's to come. Um, and in that regard, here's here's the experience of Small of Arts. And this this used to be a marketing ploy of Small of Arts is that uh, Small of Arts, we're not, we're not preparing you for your first job, we're preparing you for your fifth job, yeah, yeah. which is a crappy, crappy marketing ploy because what parent is gonna pay that much money for right. <laughs> some job 10 years, 20 years down the road? So we stopped saying that. Um, but we also can't say we're going to prepare you for your first job. That's not our business. That, that's not what we're into, right? We're not training you to become an accountant. That's not what we do. So what are we doing? And this is my experience coming from small liberal arts. It was about, it was in graduate school and I'm in graduate school. I went to University of Redlands, which is, you know, fine mm-hmm. institution, but mm-hmm. I find myself in my PhD program running circles around undergraduates who went to Harvard. Like they, they, they couldn't keep up with me. Right? It's like what? What? Is, why am I able to do all this? All these things that these people who went to these really prestigious places can't do, yeah. and uh, it's this aha moment where you're like, oh, wait a minute! It's the kind of training and the kind of engagement I had from my professors and from my in learning environment in my smaller arts that just put a fire in my belly, desired challenge confidence that I could see things from a bunch of different perspectives. That was just built into me. I want to bring that aha moment that usually happens five, 10 years out from a liberal arts degree and bring that aha moment back into those four years. So when people graduate, they graduate realizing what the heck just happened to them. Something transformative happened to them and they need to realize that now because they have to have the confidence to generate that into their future. That's a fantastic answer. What a what a vision for for higher education. Thank you for sharing that vision and for Eric for spending the whole hour really giving us the inside uh, look into how you help lead this uh, transformation here at college. Thank you so much. If people want to keep up with you, if they want to keep up with what you're doing at Beloit, what's what's the best way? <laughs> yeah. So I wish I had like a. I have no time for like a blog post or, you know, or things like that. And I, I hate to say it, but you know, I'm a recovering philosopher. So um, like, I don't really know how to tweet and I don't know what Instagram is. And so I hate to say it, but the best way to reach me is, uh, is email. And uh, I'm happy. And I'm on email all the time. It's one of, sure. it's one of my lifelines. And so if anybody wants to email me, I'm happy to reply. And it's just Boynton E at Beloit.edu, and you can find me on the Provost page. Yeah, and I, I promise you he will respond in my experience. Um, once again, uh, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate this. This is a, such an impressive drive. I appreciate your time. Well, uh, thank you. But don't don't go away, friends. I, I need to uh, point out where we're headed to the uh, uh, to the next uh, the next few weeks. Uh, remember that uh, we have all these topics coming up as we look at how higher education responds to the uh, extraordinary events of 2020. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about these, like wondering what the difference is more between mods and blocks and semesters and how advising works and what is the, really this, this benefit of liberal education, uh, we have all these great channels on Twitter, uh, which is where most of you like to hang out, it seems, uh, hashtag FTTE. But of course, we have groups in LinkedIn and Facebook as well as Slack. Um, and if you want to go back into the past and look at previous sessions, uh, including with uh, some of the questioners here today, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive or search for me on YouTube and you'll find those there. Uh, and in the meantime, thank you everybody for the really, really great, great questions. I think you really dove into this topic deeply. Um, and as always, keep thinking about these issues. Stay safe during this extraordinary time, and we'll see you online. Bye-bye.